The 1980s were the apex of a period known as the Golden Age of the Serial Killer. These murderers and their monikers, such as the Night Stalker, the BTK Killer, the Butcher Baker, and the Golden State Killer, became part of the zeitgeist of the time, but advances in forensics would help lead to their capture. Today, we look at Larry William Eiler, an American serial killer who was suspected of murdering at least 21 teenage boys and young men between 1982 and 1984 in the Midwest. Hello, and welcome back. Before we continue, take a moment to subscribe to the Past Crimes channel and leave a comment below to let us know what other past crime story you would like to hear about. Larry Eiler was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana, on December 21, 1952, as the youngest of four children to George Howard Eiler and Shirley Phyllis Kennedy. His father was an alcoholic who abused his wife and children physically and emotionally. Eiler and his sister were regularly placed in the care of babysitters, foster families, or simply left in the care of their two older siblings, the oldest of whom was 10, as their mother struggled to financially support and provide adequate care for four children, working two jobs as a waitress and in a factory on weekdays and occasionally in a bar on weekends. In Lebanon, Indiana, Eiler attended St. Joseph School. Despite being tall for his age and active in sports, he was regularly targeted by bullies due to his poor family background and his parents' divorce, which frequently led to his sister, Teresa, confronting her brother's tormentors. Teachers described Eiler as a quiet but likable student with few friends. Shortly after, Eiler was subjected to psychological tests, which revealed that he was of average intelligence, despite suffering from severe insecurity and an extreme fear of separation and abandonment. Staff recommended that Eiler be temporarily placed in a Catholic boy's home in Fort Wayne, based on his fears from his home life. He stayed at this residence for six months before returning to his mother's care. Eiler discovered he was homosexual when he reached puberty. He was only open about his sexuality to his family, despite having deep feelings of self-hatred about his sexual orientation. Throughout high school, he dated girls on occasion, but none of these relationships became physical. Eiler, who had been somewhat religious since childhood, did admit to some close friends that he struggled to accept his sexuality. Eiler later became acquainted with the Indianapolis gay community, frequenting gay bars, and engaging in casual liaisons with men. Several acquaintances in this community described him as a good-looking and laid-back guy, while others who had engaged in sexual activity with him described him as a person with a sadistic streak and violent temper that would only manifest itself during their sexual encounters. He shared a condominium in Terre Haute with a 38-year-old library science professor named Robert David Little, whom he met in 1974 while studying at Indiana State University. The two men had a platonic relationship, with Eiler considering Little to be a father figure. On August 3, 1978, Eiler picked up Craig Long, a 19-year-old hitchhiker, on 7th Street in Terre Haute. Long attempted to flee the vehicle after Eiler propositioned him. As Long stated, I don't have any money, Eiler pressed a knife against the youth's chest and replied, I'm not after your money. I'm not interested in your money. He then told Long to undress before handcuffing him, binding his ankles, and ordering him to climb into the back of the pickup. Long attempted to flee the pickup as Eiler undressed, and Eiler pursued him. Eiler stabbed the youth in the chest puncturing his lung. Long sagged to the ground, pretending to be dead. He eventually stumbled to a nearby house, where the residents called paramedics. Soon after, Isla drove to the house while Long received first aid and offered the handcuff key to a sheriff's deputy, claiming he had accidentally stabbed the young man. He was eventually arrested. Isla was later charged with aggravated battery and agreed to enter a guilty plea. A judge set his bond at $10,000, which friends raised. Eiler's attorneys offered Long a $2,500 check from Little in exchange for his agreement not to press charges. 
Long accepted the offer, and Eiler was acquitted and fined $43 on November 13 for court costs. Between 1982 and 1984, Eiler is known to have murdered at least 21 men, with several victims subjected to varying degrees of sadomasochism before being stabbed and or slashed to death, with the majority of the wounds inflicted on the victim's chest and abdomen. His victims were usually given alcohol and sedatives like ethchlorvanol before being restrained and murdered. After death, several victims were disemboweled, and Eiler is known to have dismembered the bodies of four of his victims. His victims were typically dumped in fields near major interstate highways, with their trousers and underwear frequently discovered around their knees or ankles and their shirts and wallets missing. Eiler was dubbed the interstate killer and the highway killer because many of his confirmed and alleged victims were discovered in locations near or accessible via the interstate highway system. On October 12, 1982, in Crown Point, Indiana, Eiler enticed a 21-year-old named Craig Townsend into his vehicle. The young man survived despite being drugged, severely beaten, and later abandoned naked and comatose in a rural field. On October 23rd, Eiler kidnapped and murdered a 19-year-old named Stephen Crockett. Crockett had been beaten and then stabbed to death with 32 knife wounds, four of which were to his head. Sometime the following month, Eiler murdered a 25-year-old barman named John Johnson. His body was discovered one month later. On November 20th, Eiler kidnapped William Lewis, a 19-year-old hitchhiker. He was stabbed and buried in a field near Rensselaer, Indiana. Stephen Agon, 23, was kidnapped in Terre Haute on December 19. On December 28, his body was discovered in the woods near Indiana State Road 63. An examination of an abandoned farm outbuilding near the crime scene revealed several traces of human flesh on the walls in areas where plaster had been damaged, leading investigators to believe Aegon had been suspended against the walls of this property while his murderer inflicted the injuries on his body. Dr. John Pless immediately performed an autopsy on the body of a 21-year-old man named John Roach, who had been discovered near Interstate 70 in Putnam County that same day. Plus noticed striking similarities in the injuries inflicted on Roach and Aegon, including multiple stab wounds to the victim's abdomen, upper chest, and throat, indicating the perpetrator's rage. On December 30th, a 22-year-old Yale University graduate named David Block vanished from the Illinois suburb of Highland Park. On May 7, 1984, a farmer discovered his body in a field south of Illinois Route 173. On January 24, 1983, Eiler abducted and murdered Irvin Gibson, a 16-year-old boy from Lake County, Illinois. His body was discovered on April 15, atop the body of a dog that had also been stabbed to death. Eiler is suspected of killing at least five more people between the ages of 17 and 29 between March and April 1983. Daniel Scott McNeve was discovered dead in a field near Indiana State Road 39 in Hendricks County on May 9th. McNeve's wounds immediately linked his murder to other victims suspected of being the same perpetrator. He'd been stabbed 11 times in the neck, 5 times in the back, and 11 times in the abdomen, with one wound causing sections of his small intestine to protrude through his abdomen. Furthermore, welt marks on McNeve's wrists and ankles were discovered, as well as his jeans being pulled down to his ankles. McNeve's body, like that of other victims, showed no signs of sexual assault. Police in Indiana had tentatively linked several murders of young males committed in the state to the same perpetrator by the early spring of 1983. Six days after McNeve's body was discovered, the Indiana State Police held a meeting with 35 detectives from each of the four jurisdictions where bodies of young males with wounds indicating the same perpetrator had been discovered. It was concluded that the same perpetrator was responsible for all the murders and a task force named the Central Indiana Multi-Agency Investigation Team was commanded by Lieutenant Jerry Campbell of the Indianapolis Police. 
The task force contacted the FBI's National Crime Information Center, requesting that police forces contact them if they discovered young male murder victims with wounds that matched this pattern. Shortly after, investigators in Kentucky contacted the task force to report that a 29-year-old Lexington resident named Jay Reynolds had been found stabbed to death in Madison County on March 22nd, and that his body had most likely been transported to the scene of his discovery. On May 9th, investigators in Chicago reported that the body of an 18-year-old African-American teenager named Jimmy Roberts had been discovered with 35 stab wounds in Thorn Creek. Both victims were linked to the manhunt for the same perpetrator, dubbed the highway murderer by the task force. On June 6th, a former lover of Eilers named Thomas Henderson called the investigation team's confidential hotline to express his fears that Eiler was the murderer they were looking for. He explained that his former lover had been charged with some sort of stabbing of a young hitchhiker in 1978. He also told investigators that in May 1982, Isla drugged and abandoned a 14-year-old boy in the woods near Greencastle. The boy had not been abused, and investigators suspected Isla gave him sedatives to test the drug's effectiveness. Investigators discovered Isla had been arrested in 1978 for attempting to sexually assault a teenage hitchhiker whom he had stabbed and left for dead. The handcuffing of the youth's wrists and ankle binding matched the highway murderer's technique. The FBI developed a psychological profile of the unknown killer at the request of the task force, who they predicted to be a white male in his late 20s or early 30s working in a menial profession and presenting a rough exterior in part due to his self-hatred regarding his sexual attraction to other males. On July 2nd, an unidentified Hispanic man was discovered in a field two miles outside of Paxton, Illinois, in Ford County. This victim had been stabbed in the abdomen several times and had been dead since June 27th or 28th. On August 31st, eight weeks later, a tree trimming crew discovered the body of a 28-year-old man named Ralph Calise in a field near a tollway near Illinois Route 60. Lake County detectives quickly linked this murder to the stabbing deaths of two other young men whose bodies were discovered nearby earlier in 1983. Irvin Gibson and Gustavo Herrera. Ralph Calise, a 28-year-old man, was the victim. He'd been stabbed with a butcher or hunting knife 17 times. In early September, Garolyn Kollerick, a Chicago-based reporter for WLS-TV, noted similarities between Calise's August 31st murder and two previous deaths of young males in Lake County. Kollerick had seen other murders of young males in Indiana with similar signature knife mutilations. Kollerick learned from Cook County investigators that two more young male murder victims who had lived in or disappeared from uptown in 1982 had been discovered with multiple stab wounds to their bodies and their trousers and underwear pulled down to their ankles in Kankakee County, Illinois, and Lowell, Indiana. On September 8th, investigators from all jurisdictions in both states where these additional bodies were discovered met with senior task force representatives in Crown Point to discuss whether these five deaths were also the result of the same perpetrator, investigators now believe killed up to 17 young males. One month later, on October 4th, Two mushroom hunters in Kenosha County, Wisconsin, discovered a human torso hidden inside a plastic bag. The victim was identified as 18-year-old Eric Hansen, who was last seen alive in St. Francis on September 27th. A hacksaw was used to sever Hansen's head, arms, and legs from his torso, and the torso itself had been completely drained of blood. The hands and skull were never discovered. For more victims, partially decomposed bodies were discovered alongside an oak tree near an abandoned farmhouse in Lake Village, Indiana, on October 18th. Each victim had been dead for several months, and all four decedents had been partially buried, with parts of each victim's body visible above ground. Each of the four victims had been stabbed more than two dozen times with a blade at least eight inches long, and their trousers were discovered around their ankles. On December 7th, two months later, a hunter discovered the partially buried skeleton of another victim in Hendricks County, near U.S. Route 40. 
Richard Wayne, 17, was identified as the victim. A few feet from where Wayne was buried, the body of a second, less decomposed victim was discovered beneath the ruins of a burned mobile home. Eiler was arrested in Lowell, Indiana on September 30th, prior to the discovery at the abandoned farmhouse. A sergeant named William Cothran had searched Eiler's Ford F-Series pickup at the roadside without his consent and before informing him he was under arrest, and discovered two sections of nylon rope, after which the vehicle was impounded. Two task force investigators conducted a formal interview with Isla shortly after 1.30 p.m., informing him that he had become a suspect in the series of murders. Isla claimed he read press coverage of both murders in the Indianapolis Star, but he denied ever committing a murder. He agreed to allow the investigators to conduct a forensic examination of his vehicle and to allow them to take his mugshot, copies of his fingerprints, and subject him to a polygraph test at a later date. After the forensic examination of Eiler's pickup was completed, Indiana investigators informed him that he was free to leave and keep possession of his vehicle. Due to concerns that Eiler's knowledge that he was now a murder suspect might lead to him disposing of any potential evidence, investigators from the task force obtained a search warrant authorizing their search of Robert Little's Terre Haute home in the early hours of October 1st. This search, which began at dawn on October 2nd, uncovered additional circumstantial evidence, such as credit card receipts, indicating Eiler's presence in jurisdictions in both Illinois and Indiana on the dates identified victims linked to the highway murderer were killed. An examination of phone bills recovered from the property revealed that Eiler had made collect calls to Little's home at odd hours, shortly after the identified victims were thought to have been murdered. One of these calls to Little's house came from a payphone near Cook County Hospital on April 8th, the date of victim Gustavo Herrera's murder. Eiler received treatment for a deep cut to his hand on this date, which he claimed was caused by a fall from his truck in which he landed on a glass beer bottle. Receipts recovered from the property revealed he had purchased handcuffs and a knife the next day. Investigators also discovered that Eiler and Little had recently returned to Indiana after spending several weeks on vacation in New York City. Following these revelations, an Indiana task force member named Kathy Burner told her colleagues that if Eiler was not the murderer they were looking for, he was tracking the actual killer on a daily basis. A state attorney granted Illinois investigators permission to seize Eiler's truck. On the evening of October 2nd, the vehicle was impounded at the Lake County Sheriff's Headquarters, and Eiler accompanied investigators to Waukegan to submit to further questioning by an investigator named Dan Collin. On this occasion, he admitted to Collin that he liked to be the dominant partner in bondage sessions, that his relationship with Dobrovolskis was a love-hate relationship, that he and Dobrovolskis frequently argued, and that his lover had occasionally struck him. He denied owning the tire tracks and boot impressions discovered at the Calise murder scene, claiming he had never met the victim. Colin then told Eiler, Larry, we have some information about you. You'd get into a fight with John, then pick someone else to stab because you thought it was John. Eiler winced visibly at this accusation. Eiler requested legal representation from a Chicago lawyer named Kenneth Ditkowski shortly after his release from custody on October 4th. Ditkowski filed a civil suit against both the Lake County Sheriff's Police and the Indiana State Police on October 11th, citing harassment of his client and contending investigators in both states had violated the 14th Amendment and Eiler's civil rights by involving him in their collective investigation with the Lake County Deputy Chief Investigator. In both states, the suit sought $250,000 in damages from 11 named officers. The boot and tire imprints discovered at the scene of Ralph Kalisa's murder were delivered to the FBI's headquarters on October 6th. Days later, the FBI informed investigators that the boot impressions were a dead ringer, with four distinct areas of wear and damage to the soles. Eiler's pickup's tire impressions were a perfect match in terms of grip depth to that found at the scene. On October 28th, 
investigators obtained a warrant authorizing the retrieval of Eiler's hair and blood samples for comparison with evidence previously retrieved from Eiler's vehicle, which was to be served the next day. On October 29th, Eiler was formally charged with Kalisa's murder, with his bond set at $1 million and an initial trial date set for December 19th. Lake County investigators obtained a search warrant on November 1st to conduct a second search of Robert Little's home. On November 12th, a criminal defense attorney named David Shippers was appointed to replace Kenneth Ditkowski as Eiler's legal representative. In December 1983, Lake County Circuit Judge William Block ruled that, while Eiler's initial arrest for the traffic violation was legal, his subsequent detention, during which evidence was recovered by Indiana police and now presented before him, was obtained without probable cause, and that Eiler's detention was illegal. Due to the fact that the search of the Dobrovolsky residence on October 3rd had been conducted without a search warrant, Eiler was released from custody at the subsequent January 1984 hearing to determine whether the physical evidence recovered following Eiler's arrest should be suppressed. The physical evidence recovered by Illinois investigators in their comparison of his boot prints and tire tracks to the plaster casts recovered at the Calise crime scene was tainted, according to Judge Block, because the search was prompted by Eiler's initial illegal detention by Indiana investigators, which violated his constitutional rights. On August 19, 1984, around 10.30 p.m., Eiler enticed a 16-year-old uptown teen named Daniel Bridges to his apartment. The youth was bound to a chair with clothesline inside Eiler's apartment before being beaten, tortured, and stabbed to death. Bridges' body was then dismembered in Eiler's bathroom. His body was dismembered into eight pieces, each of which was thoroughly drained of blood before being placed in six separate plastic bags. On the morning of August 21, 1984, a janitor named Joseph Bala discovered Daniel Bridges' dismembered body. His remains were discovered in a garbage dumpster near Eiler's apartment and in a unit not intended for use by tenants in Eiler's apartment complex. On August 22nd, Eiler was formally charged with Bridges' murder. An autopsy revealed that death was caused by multiple wounds inflicted with a knife and an awl-like instrument. Although no facial fractures were visible, the teenager had clearly been beaten around the right eye and suffered numerous shallow cuts to his face before his death. Fourteen ice pick or all wounds were also visible on and around Bridges' sternum. These wounds had also been inflicted prior to death. Furthermore, five knife wounds to the abdomen were significantly deep, causing sections of Bridges' intestine to protrude through the wounds. Three more knife wounds were inflicted on the teenager's back with such force that the heart and left lung were perforated. Convicted and sentenced to death by lethal injection for the 1984 kidnapping and murder of 16-year-old Daniel Bridges, he later voluntarily confessed to the 1982 murder of 23-year-old Stephen Agon, offering to also confess to his culpability in 20 further unsolved homicides if the state of Illinois would commute his sentence to life imprisonment without parole. While on death row, Eiler died of age-related complications in 1994. Shortly before his death, he confessed to his defense attorney Kathleen Zellner to the murders of 20 more young men and boys, though he denied being physically responsible for Bridges' murder, which he claimed was committed by an alleged accomplice in five of his homicides, Robert David Little. <laughs>